The number one answer to everything I'm going to say today is we start from the beginning and we start with relationships. We have to see, hear, and know the people that we're going to church with, the people that are coming in the door, and just be human and connect with people. Yeah. And I can talk more about that, but that's that's the root of, of the answer. Welcome everyone to podcast number 181, Renew Your Mind. With us today, we'll see how I can get this right. <laughs> uh, we have senior pastor Paul Gruenberg, and we have associate pastor Jeremy True. We have uh, praise leader, youth and family director Jordan Kettlewell. We have associate, no, we have retired pastor Barry Sweet. <laughs> Sorry, Barry. I'm still retired. Yes. <laughs> still retired. But very active. That way. <laughs> um, um, we have myself, mm-hmm. Dana Hall, as the moderator, and we have a very special guest, uh, Jesse Thompson. We're going to move into a series on mental health, and um, we welcome Jesse here. Mm-hmm. And uh, Jesse, you want to introduce yourself and um, what your title and what you do? Sure. Thanks, Dana. My name is Jesse Thompson. I am a licensed clinical therapist in the state of Michigan. I've been doing um, therapy, mental health therapy, for over 10 years with youth, children, and families. Um, just recently started doing this inside of the Methodist Church in Gaylord and just really excited to share how that ministry is going and what we can do as a church to help promote mental health and to take care of those that are struggling the most. Oh, good. Amen. Oh, that's a great, yeah, great segue into, we wanted to ask a couple questions and we wanted to, this podcast or this first series or episode, we wanted to kind of talk generally and then we want to have a lot more um, podcasts on, you know, specific topics. But one thing, I guess just to kick it off is um, how should we approach mental health? Uh, I guess within the Christian world or, you know, does the church do anything right? Do they do anything wrong? Um, kind of an open-ended question, but we'll throw that out there. Sure. I'm just going to speak openly and hopefully I answer the question. But um, I think the first thing is just to acknowledge that it exists, that mental health is something that we all have and it's either well or it's not, or it's somewhere in the middle. It's a spectrum But um, I think it's really important that I share some statistics first just to make it known how prevalent it is and what we're dealing with. So this came from um, Matthew Stanford, who's a researcher for the Baylor College of Medicine and also Houston Methodist Hospital Institute for Academic Medicine. So um, the statistics that he shared were pre-COVID. And so it's really important to note that these have only gotten worse since um, the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So um, the majority of individuals never receive treatment. Um, 50% are Caucasian who have mental health concerns. And those who do wait an average of 11 years to get treatment. So 50% of mental health diagnosis are set in at age 14. 75% by the time someone's 24 years old, 45 million individuals have mental illness, and there are only 100,000 beds in the United States. 44 states, the largest psychiatric unit is jail. 64% of inmates have mental illness. When we make kids wait 11 years, so when we go back to that um, people are waiting 11 years to get treatment, Jail is their destiny, unfortunately. So this is how the U.S. deals with mental health. Um, It's mental health. Actually, the second leading cause of death in 10-year-olds is suicide. Um, 30% of overdose deaths um, are those who have anxiety and depression. And 50% of teens uh, worsened or new mental health condition have never seen these numbers. I'm sorry. I don't really know what. I can't read my writing. (laughs) Um, And then here's a really, this is when we're talking about what the church can do. I think this is just a staggering statistic is that 50 to 75% of those suffering with mental illness approach clergy before their doctor or anybody else. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And 
90% of churches offer pastoral counseling, but less than 10% ever make an actual mental health referral. And that's less than 25% provide specialized ministry for mental illness. And then 70% of pastors are saying that they are inadequately trained in mental health. So when we are, when the church is the first place that people are going to, but we are not equipped to handle, that's a problem. That's a mm-hmm. gap in, mm-hmm. in what we could be doing. So these are just um, some, again, these are numbers post or pre-COVID, and they've only grown because COVID had led to isolation and shutdowns and lack of church involvement and different things that we were unable to do during the shutdown. So it's just staggering. It's staggering. And so I think the first thing is to acknowledge it, Mm -hmm. that we are most certainly sitting in the pews with somebody who's struggling and that we all struggle with it at some point in our life. So what we're doing well is that we are continuing to have church, that a lot of us are going there um, all with the same idea to worship Christ. But what we're not doing well, I think, is we live in a very busy culture. We're very, very busy. I'm busy. I, I do this too, but we aren't always acknowledging or seeing or hearing or considering the people that we're going mm-hmm. to church with. So um, the number one answer to everything I'm going to say today as we start from the beginning and we start with relationships. We have to see, hear, and know the people that we're going to church with, the people that are coming in the door, and just be human and connect with people. Yeah. And I can talk more about that, but that's that's the root of, of the answers. And I think you said something really important in there about that we might be sitting in a pew next to somebody um, and that, yeah, we might be at any time, more than likely we are at any time. But also you, you mentioned that the average person, it's 11 years before they're, before they're seeking any treatment, which means there's a fair chance that you're not sitting next to somebody, that you're sitting in the pew and you're a person struggling with some sort of mental health issue and not acknowledging it, trying to push it away, trying to pretend that it's not there. Yes. And that's... I mean, that's also something that we need to be able to be present and acknowledge if like within ourselves if that's if that's going on. Cause a lot of times we just push that out, especially in the in a public church setting. Oh yeah. yeah. And we were talking before we got together here about how at church we put on our masks. We mm-hmm. put on our good happy face. And sometimes we're just not happy at all. Mm-hmm. We're we're going to church because we need to or because we're supposed to. Um, but <clears throat> we're a mess inside. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so on some levels, that's a good thing, but we're not being real enough. Mm-hmm. Right. And I'm not sure how to solve that problem because I think it isn't just mental health issues. I think there's a lot of places that that happens in the church where we're just not real with one another. Mm-hmm. Well, I had a question. Um, how do you know, <clears throat> like you said, somebody might take 11 years before they reach out to get help. But how do they, how does one realize they need help? I mean, what are the things mm, that they're experiencing? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's not always depression or, I mean, how do they know it? Well, I guess that would be the question is define trauma. What, what can cons- constitutes a trauma? Because I was thinking, for instance, what Jeremy experiences and what I experience may be the same thing, but we process differently. Mm-hmm. And what may be more traumatic for one is not as traumatic for the other. Right. So if you could define trauma for us. Okay. Well, trauma has many definitions. It's really complex mm-hmm. and it is individualized. Mm-hmm. But um, through all my research and working with people, the definition is really anything that's upsetting, confusing, or unpredictable that happens to us that changes the way we view ourselves or the way or the world around us. So a really good example is um, a car accident. So if we get into a car accident and something tragic happens mm-hmm. and we that was unpredictable, it was upsetting, it was confusing. Why did this happen? And now we're questioning who we are. I can't drive anymore. I'm a murderer. I'm I'm um, I'm unsafe. I'm incapable of getting into another car. So that's changed our perception of ourselves Mm -hmm. and the world around. Cars are dangerous. Everybody's dangerous. I'm never driving on the roads again. So it's just a 
a, a classic example of how that can happen. Mm. But what um, there's a psych- psychiatrist, Bessel van der Kolk, he's the trauma pioneer, and he just simply defines it as tr- anything that's not nurturing. So mm. if you think oh. about that, mm. it can be anything. It can mm-hmm. be anything. And so like Pastor Paul said, what's traumatizing to me isn't necessarily traumatizing to you. Trauma is relative, and it really depends on our biological makeup, our family supports, our belief system, Mm -hmm. if we have um, a firm foundation in Christ or not, Mm -hmm. those things, a healthy family, healthy supports, those are our foundations. Mm -hmm. And so if we are solid in that, trauma is not going to impact us as badly as somebody who has a neglectful or abusive family. So we're not all on the same playing field. And I think that's something else to consider when we're sitting with people at church or just knowing we're not all thinking or dealing with the same stuff in the same Mm. way. But trauma quite literally affects the neural pathways in our brain Mm. and the biological makeup. It lives in our DNA and in our cells. So if we have ongoing trauma as a child, so I think a lot of just the kids who have unpredictable caregivers, ones that are maybe on drugs or there's domestic violence in the home or they're neglected, their brain is literally wiring to stay alive. I have to Mm. stay alive. Mm. This is a war zone. So that means their stress response Mm. system, that fight, flight, freeze we hear Mm -hmm. so often, Mm. starts to be programmed to be on all of the time because there is no safety. So they're always searching for danger. And when that's on, it's really important to note that the the higher order thinking of our brains, like the ones that are responsible for learning, um, connecting with others, um, language, processing, organizing is completely offline. Mm-hmm. So there's physiologically the doing stress response and the thinking cannot be on at the same time when we're faced with stressors. And so this is what we're seeing in schools. Um, We have a lot of kids being misdiagnosed with ADHD or um, bipolar or, you know, there's just different diagnoses out there when the root of it is trauma because it looks the same. We're Mm -hmm. looking, we're looking for danger. We're not sitting in class and sitting still and being able to take in what our teachers are saying or we're fighting. We're punching kids. We're bullying kids because that's a a stress response Mm -hmm. to keep them safe. And so I think that's important for the church, too, just when we're seeing kids or teens or even adults misbehaving, there's always there's always a reason why that's happening. Um, I forget where we were going. With this. But I really like trauma. trauma yeah. But trauma, I really yeah. liked what you said about when a person's mind is dealing with trauma, they can't have a relationship or a con- conversation. They mm-hmm. just can't act like normally like we would expect Mm -hmm. so expectations of having that relationship with somebody trying to just survive is really important i never thought about that Mm -hmm. well there's the building of walls to protect yourself Uh you Mm -hmm. know and and you have to be careful who you let in or how you even let people know about you Mm -hmm. and you're not not going to be real because you've got to protect that part of yourself Mm -hmm. and when you're always protecting yourself you can't have a real, genuine relationship. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Well, and also, you know, on top of that, there's the the actual real physiological um, response, like Jesse was talking about, when you're dealing with a with significant trauma that presents like ADHD. A lot of times, mm. it seems like, mm-hmm. oh, yes, this kid's not paying attention, or this person's not paying attention. They can't retain anything. But when you're in that, when you're in that mode, it's not that you're mm. distracted. You you physically, you're like you you're not you're not Nothing's transferring over to short or long term memory. Mm-hmm. So mid conversation, you're, you're you're not picking anything up. You forget where you're even at, where you're talking. We've all had that moment where you walk into a room and you forgot why you went to that room. Mm-hmm. So that trauma <laughs> every day. <Yeah. laughs> that that trauma. You know, when you're in that when you're in that in that moment of of dealing with trauma like that. That's where you live. You live yeah. in that moment of, I just walked into a room and I, I don't remember why I was mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. Every conversation, everything you try to learn, everything you try to remember, you're just living in that moment. And that in itself also is terrifying. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Jesse, to go back to um, your comment about having healthy foundations in the life, which as followers of Christ, we would, you know, we'd view that as our faith in Jesus, our ch- church family relationships, our our family, if we have a healthy family, hopefully just those foundations that we're anchored in. 
um, does that serve as um, almost like in advance of a trauma incident that does help in a respect to sort of shield the effects of it or, or lessen them perhaps? Yes. Not that it do, it's not still hurtful to you, but that it's almost like preparing foundations in advance of an event happening is a healthy thing. Yes. It's kind of like as Christians, we're being formed in the faith constantly. We want to be one to be forming our kids in the faith already formed so that when the storm does come, they can withstand it. Yes. Instead of when the storm comes, all of a sudden trying to find faith. Yes. Is that, do you see that um, when viewing, you know, somebody that you would call having healthy foundations versus somebody who may be lacking those? Yes. And that's called resiliency. Resiliency. In the good trauma word. world. Yes. Yeah. The okay. ability to bounce back or withstand mm-hmm. adverse experiences. And so mm-hmm. a lot of studies go say that really we just need one supportive person in our life to be able to come over trauma. So if you just think about that, the way God mm-hmm. designed us in relationship is just one. But if you think about the body of Christ and our call to carry each other's burdens, how much more powerful that is when you have mm-hmm. a whole community behind you and our kids are just going to be more resilient and able to withstand because there will be suffering. There will be, That's there right. was no promise. This would be easy, yeah. but um, we are also called to hold each other in that. So that goes back to the first question. How do we, how can we do better? Um, this is it. This is sitting with people in the well, in their darkness, in their suffering. And it doesn't always mean problem solving. So there's mm-hmm. a lot of that too, just to mm-hmm. be aware. We're not people who are hurting don't want to hear all the ways that you can solve this, that they can go solve these problems, because again, we're not able to take in that information in those mm-hmm. moments of stress. But they just want somebody with them, sitting with them, even if that means nobody speaking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Some mm-hmm. of the, my, as a pastor, some of my most helpful times in someone else's life is when they're in crisis and I'm at the hospital with them or whatever, <coughs> it's and just, just sitting with yeah. them and just being present. there. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes words actually get in the way. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. presence that makes a huge difference. Huge. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it, it is a, um, an interesting process, the pastoral presence or just a friend being there. And when you're talking about one person needing one person to be there, Mm -hmm. you know, as a pastor, you're in a sense, uh, there's a sense of being the godly representative Mm -hmm. and uh, being present with people in their moment of need. And the interesting thing when you said they don't want to be fixed, I, I go back to we were just married maybe three, four months. And, and Lene would say, you know, she's dealing with this or that. And I would say, well, have you tried this or tried that? <laughs> it, only Danger. T- Danger will <laughs> <laughs> it only took a few months before she said to me, I don't need you to solve my problem. I just need you to listen to me. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. Um, and that's, you know, you and I have talked, Jesse, that 80, 90% of helping people is just listening. Mm-hmm. And it's not, it's not rocket science, but active listening is a skill mm-hmm. that you develop over time. And to walk with someone through, uh, you know, scripturally, when you said someone, I thought when we can make, when we can enter into a relationship with God that is, that is not formal, but is truly relational, then we have that presence always with us. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know that the Christian world is, I mean, I remember growing up in the church and God was something to be talked about at church and worshiped at church. And, and in my family of origin, we did not worship God at home. I mean, we said table prayers, uh, bedtime prayers, I remember my mom uh, maybe read us a a portion of scripture, but that went away pretty Mm -hmm. quick. And we had our own set of issues at at home and, and the, um, the growing up without understanding a relationship with God versus 
you know, worshiping this deity somewhere off in heaven mm-hmm. was a is a is a real challenge for Christians to. I, I think it's entering into that personal relationship, and it's being with God and knowing God personally. That that is that change for Christians to know that you're not alone. And then all of a sudden, other scripture comes up to my mind regarding that. You know, when you're tempted, when you're experiencing something, you know, you can call on God, and God is there with you. And you feel God's presence, and you, you feel God's peace and comfort in those moments. And then you have to deal with the trauma, right? Mm-hmm. How did it change me? How did I feel unsafe? Those types of things. And that's where that's where other people, so I would say Jesse is God in human clothes. Uh, when we put uh, somebody who's skilled and a Christian involved with somebody's life, God uses them. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I always thought, early on, I thought, man, I should be able to go to God with everything and I should be okay. And I can, but sometimes I need to talk to people mm-hmm. and uh, have a conversation with someone and they're, they're God's presence for me mm-hmm. in that moment. God yeah. uses people to do his work. Oh, yeah, that's yeah, right. That can so be his will to do it yeah. that way. Yeah. So yeah. on that yeah. note, um, since I am not a pastor, <laughs> but mm-hmm. how does somebody that's not a pastor, um, you know, reach out to create those relationships? Um, you know, are you looking for things? Are you just... Um, trying to, you know, reach out personally, like how should we go about that? Mm -hmm. Um, I think the most important thing is to know people aren't going to go around and being like, I have depression or I have anxiety, but you're going to be hearing in what they're saying. So I just lost my job or I haven't talked to my wife in a few weeks or I just, my heart is racing. And so we're listening to people's stories and we're, we're attuning to them and we're validating them like, yeah, that must be really hard and giving people those safe places to Mm -hmm. share that story and to share their struggle. Mm -hmm. And for you to be able to do that, you have to know your own story too. You have to Mm -hmm. know where you're coming from, your traumas, your triggers, Mm -hmm. and we need to be dealing with those effectively through counseling or um, mental health therapy or treatment, we always have to be aware of what we're bringing to the table too and what might trigger us. So I think that's, um, there's a lot of work that goes into that, but the simplicity of it too Mm -hmm. is just being in relationship with people and loving them because he first loved us. So he's teaching us how to do that. Mm -hmm. And he'll equip us in those moments Mm -hmm. too, but we're not seeking them Mm -hmm. out. We're just being available. Mm -hmm. Sure. So I think that goes back to being a good listener. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, once you've heard making yourself available Mm -hmm. and accessible, Mm -hmm. um, you know, and maybe even putting yourself in a place putting yourself in their path to some degree, Mm -hmm. letting them choose how much they want to include you Mm -hmm. um, and have them discover that you are a safe place and a safe Mm -hmm. person to share with. That didn't happen overnight. That takes Mm -hmm. some time. Yeah. Yeah. And that takes some, that that genuinely, this might sound silly, but that takes some real effort, especially nowadays, because like, like you were saying, Jesse, like we're all busy. Mm. So if you've got a friend that you know is struggling and you want to be, you do want to be there for them, but there's also a part of you that's like, well, I've got these other 40 million things yeah. that I also have to do. And it's mm-hmm. so easy to want to be there for them in that moment. And when that moment's over, you just move on with your life. You don't think about it. And then next thing you know, it's like two months later and you're talking to them again. And well, they're still in that same place. And so mm-hmm. it does take deliberate effort to go like, I, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. I'm going to check in. Mm-hmm. I'm just, how you doing? Yeah, my, Nothing. my favorite word is being intentional. Yeah. Yes. But it That's does good. take energy and takes time mm-hmm. and you have to choose it. Mm-hmm. And and in the midst of crazy busy lives, that's sometimes really hard to do because mm-hmm. when you're stepping into somebody else's stuff, you could be stepping into a lot of stuff, mm-hmm. you know, and, and it could take some effort and energy um, just to be the listener part, much less when we want to fix things, which really... A lot of us aren't equipped to do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it takes time. Time is a big issue. You know, I, what I, it, if you've never seen Jesse's office, I mean, I just love the setup. 
you know, the couch and the, a different rug and, you know, it's not so clinical. Mm. Um, it's more of a, this is a safe place and mm. you have to provide that safe place. And part of that is your countenance, um, how you look, how you listen. It's, it's active listening is what it's called. Mm-hmm. And being able to impart to somebody that you're truly, you're truly listening to them as, um, and I go always go back, you know, the way God listens to me is how I want to listen to somebody else. Mm-hmm. I may not understand their, uh, all of the nuances and stuff like that. But if I can be that kind of that first level of listening, Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I've done my job. And then I say, Hey, Jesse, (laughs) (laughs) which is important. important It is. It is when, you know, we're a listener and we're available and we're caring and walking with them. But maybe the second piece or third piece down that road is getting them to someone who's trained Mm. to help them go further. Mm-hmm. Because we're way out of our comfort zone and our ability level, um, we can still walk with them yeah. as they go to someone. But maybe we need to bring them to someone like Jesse mm-hmm. and and say, "I'll even go with you if it'll make it easier." Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, I can listen to you, but you need somebody who's trained more than I am and recognize our limits. Because, yeah. like you said, Jesse, was it, was it like ten percent of people that go to? Clergy first actually end up with a referral for any kind of, I forget what the numbers were. Something like um, that. But it's yeah. a, it was a low percentage mm-hmm. that actually end up taking that that yes. step. And, yes. you know, mm-hmm. okay, you know, I, we've we've discussed this. Now, hey, Jesse, I need you to. And would some of in. that be, some of that would be part of the level of the trauma. Yes. Sure. Mm-hmm. So maybe for one person to go to a clergy person and, and spend an hour and, and just talk through things is it, it moves them to that place of safety, that mm-hmm. place of relationship. Mm-hmm. And then for others, um, and there was somebody that uh, came to me and it, it was going to be way beyond me. Mm-hmm. Um, and so um, I pushed Jesse on him. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, that was the best decision I made sure. beyond yeah. just being there for the moment. I think moment. it's a wonderful thing that you know, Gaylord Methodist Church and that are working with you and that we're kind of partnering a little bit. Yes. Um, not just giving you space, but that's ministry. Yes. Absolutely. And I know that's how you view it. Mm-hmm. Yep. And and I think it needs to be part of the church's ministry is to work with people and move them in your direction or someone else's direction to get that help. And that's part of ministry. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I'm excited that you're in the building. Thank you. You know, I yeah. think that makes Amen. a huge difference mm-hmm. for what we yeah. can do. Yeah, in, yeah, in it's very powerful. Yeah. I mean, well, our ministry to individuals who are who need the healing of Christ becomes much more holistic. Yes, and we have you know, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. somebody like you offering their gifts and time in an area of specific expertise. It's just yeah, yeah because we pastors amazing. and even lay people aren't trained in mental health. Mm. Um, we can go so far, but mm. then we have to find people like you if people are even willing to go there. And then that's where we have to walk with them and encourage and mm-hmm. sometimes mm-hmm. keep encouraging until mm-hmm. they get the ability or the strength or the willingness to walk through your door. Yeah. I think yeah. having systems in place at the yeah. church is really important. I do too. Mm-hmm. Triaging. And yeah. um, this is a really good step in that direction. We're opening the door. We are setting the stage that this is okay. There's kind of removes the stigma mm-hmm. and the fear when we're openly discussing this at church, when we're having sermons about mental health, mm-hmm. when we have availability and it's just there. It makes it less. Well, I think that's scary. part scary. of the church. Yeah. We need to, as we're talking among ourselves at church and view what you're doing as Mm -hmm. ministry Mm -hmm. and telling our people that this is the part of what we do now. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, and and if you need this Mm -hmm. or you know someone who needs this, it's part of the church's ministry. Yeah. And that there is no, there is no stigma there because that's all part of the ministry and how we want to, how we want to, how we want to help. If you're struggling with a mental health issue, um, it, you know, it doesn't mean that you haven't read enough scripture. It yes. doesn't mean that yes. you're right. that you're you know that you don't know Jesus the way the other Christian knows Jesus. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I got a question for you, Jesse, but we're gonna have to wait a uh, an episode. Okay, mm-hmm. yeah, we do. We yeah, uh, we've got a lot more to go. We I have a too. lot more questions, <laughs> so we really appreciate you being here today, Jesse, to kind of kick us off on this um, yes. series. So and we need to have you back. 
I'll yes. be back. So yes. great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again for being here. Um, thank you to our listeners. Uh, we come to you from the Gaylord Methodist Church. And uh, we have two services on Sunday. We have a 9 a.m. traditional. We have a 1045 contemporary. We also have some Wednesday night services every other Wednesday at 7 p.m. And um, we'd love to have you join us. So feel free to come join us in person. Um, if you can't come in person, you can view us via YouTube or Facebook Live. And if you have any other questions, just Google us or call the office. Uh, we're located at 215 South Center Street in Gaylord. Uh, thanks, everyone, for listening. <laughs>